Thank you everyone for attending today's Fulbright Forum uh, entitled Geopolitical Model for the Next Decade presented by Dr. George Friedman. Um, we'll have an introduction and discussion with Ambas Ambassador Rekha, who is a member of our national board. I am now gonna turn it over to Ambas Ambassador Rekha for the introduction. Um, if you have any questions during the talk, please use the Q&A down at the bottom and we will get to your questions uh, at the end. All right, Rekha, turn over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Munir, and thank you very much, uh, everyone uh, who could join us today. It's a very special discussion that we're going to have uh, uh, today. Uh, I'm honored and very excited to have uh, a wonderful person as our special guest. Let me start with a strong quote about him. Considering how right uh, George Friedman has been over the years, he's really worth listening to. Another one, Friedman is one of the country's leading strategic affairs experts, uh, an author of several seminal books, including several New York Times bestseller, the, uh, including The Next Decade and The Next 100 Years, which are among my favorite readings as well, founder and chairman of, the Geo of Geopolitical Futures, which uh, specializes in geopolitical forecasting. Uh, prior to this, uh, chairman uh, and uh, founder of the global intelligence company Stratfor. Um, Dr. Uh, George Friedman has briefed numerous military and government organizations in the United States and overseas. He appears regularly as an expert on international affairs, foreign policy and intelligence, uh, and in major international and uh, US media. I'm here um, in a double capacity and I'm very excited and honored to have you as our guest because I am in one capacity, I'm an avid reader of your writings and I just can't tell you how much inspiration I get from this and how much insight it, uh, they give uh, every time I read and reread them. And in another capacity, I'm very honored to have you as my friend. So thank you so much for accepting our invitation. And before further ado, let's jump into the middle of the discussion. Uh, we have a fascinating topic, um, which really is uh, uh, opening us, you know, uh, to a longer term thinking. We're under the pressures of a very hard year be behind us. COVID has hit us in a, in a very personal way, but also every country and every uh, organization has been hit by this experience. It also allows us to have a little more breathing space maybe to think ahead and look ahead and try to understand you know, how to organize our organizations, our mission, uh, especially as a, a Fulbrighters um, in the uh, years ahead of us on the basis of the experience that we have had behind us and maybe on some of the signs of the future of what we can see. So. With this, George, thank you so much for accepting the invitation. The floor is yours. Thank you. And uh, this all proves that technology is evil, always. <laughs> yes. It used to be you stood up, you saw your audience, waved and left. Now, this. <laughs> Indeed. So I want to talk about the next decade. But first, I'd like to make a distinction between foreign policy and geopolitics. Foreign policy is what you wish would happen. Foreign policy is what you wish other people would think you wish would happen. <laughs> Foreign policy is merely a possibility that you think is good or helpful or what have you. Geopolitics is what does happen. So you can brief each other as much as you want. And of course, in Washington, the basic gross domestic product is policy papers, but history moves on. This is not to be Marxist or Hegelian. It is simply to face the fact that we live in a world of constraints. We live in a world of imperatives and we cannot do what cannot be done and we must do what must be done. To begin with, I would like to just point out that U.S. foreign policy, like all foreign policy, is much more consistent than it looks. The speeches are different, the policy is the same. When Barack Obama took power, he had three policy imperatives. One, withdraw U.S. forces from the Middle East. Two, force China to change its import policy 
toward the United States. We forget that he was the one who opened the confrontation with China. Uh, and thirdly, to limit the ability of the Soviet Union to move westward. This was uh, after Ukraine and so on. Donald Trump's foreign policy was to withdraw troops from the Middle East, to confront China more intensely on trade issues, and to confront Russia by placing troops and keeping troops in Poland and maintaining sanctions and so on. Joe Biden is now president. His policies are to withdraw troops from the Middle East, to confront the Chinese, and confront the Russians. Three presidents, each of whom loathed each other, well, perhaps Biden didn't loathe Trump, uh, Biden didn't, excuse me, Biden didn't oppose um, Obama, but still three very different presidents, utterly different foreign policies, identical actions. Why? We had to withdraw from the Middle East. We were losing troops to no end. It was not working. Secondly, it was inconceivable that China would have free access to the American market, but the United States would not have an equivalent access to the Chinese market. And thirdly, we had all lived through the Cold War, at least some of us did, and we did not want to see the return of Russia to the Carpathian mountain frontier or to the Polish frontier because that was very difficult. And so we had this foreign policy. Very few of them would have said, this is my foreign policy. They just did it. They did it because there was little choice. So in talking about the next decade, what makes it possible is the impersonal. It is not a policy paper that is written by Blinken that describes what he will do. It is the reality that the world faces. And so that's where I'm going to start from, not from what policies I'd like to see happen. I would like me to be president and I would like to have all the ice cream that's available. Well, neither of those things are gonna happen. So let's not discuss what I want. Let's begin with a reality, a really simple reality because the foundation of geopolitics is simplicity. There are four great land masses on the globe. There is Africa, South America, Eurasia, and North America. Between these great land masses are oceans, some seas as the Mediterranean. Water separates them. When we talk about Eurasia, this was the center of gravity of the global system. But it has a defect. It has massive dividing lines between the various parts. There's the Himalayas. There are the grasslands that you find very difficult to pass. And this mass was constantly at war with each other, not only between segments, but as with Europe, inside of Europe. Part of the problem was that some areas were too crowded. And Europe is certainly a crowded country. So I once counted 52 separate political entities in Europe. Um, the likelihood of these not having conflicts is very low. We are now in a period where a serious attempt is made to limit those conflicts. They failed to do that in the Balkans, so they declared Balkans not to really be European. 100,000 dead since, since then. So when we look at Eurasia, we look at an entity that's vast, tense, in some parts impoverished, in some parts massively successful, never quite at peace. Now, the most important event, I think in the past thousand years, which is a lot of nerve saying it, happened in 1991. In 1991, the heartland of Eurasia, the Soviet Union, collapsed. And for the first time in history, or certainly for 500 years, there was no European global power. The European power became regional. And even regionally, it reached out to others to help shape it. Now, you have to understand how important this was. Because for the first time, 
the Atlantic, first time since the 15th century, the Atlantic was not under European control. For the first time, Europe could not project its power through the Atlantic, even if there was such a thing as Europe, but it couldn't do it. The United States came at this point, undisputed dominant power of the Atlantic, simultaneously almost with becoming the dominant power of the Pacific, which happened within World War II. Now the United States exists in a unique position. Unlike Eurasia, or even South America, or even uh, Africa, there is no possibility of a North American war between North American nations. Canada is, will be irritated with us always. We understand the, the problems, but there's not gonna be a war. Mexico and the United States have been bickering ever since the Mexican War ended in the 18th and the 19th century, but there can be no war, even if there wish to be a war. The American the United States is so powerful that at this point it is inconceivable to be war. So the four land masses, one has an imposed peace. Secondly, the United States controls the Atlantic and the Pacific, which means it cannot be attacked from the sea. It can be attacked by nuclear weapons, missiles or something, but it cannot be attacked from the sea. And this defines a huge shift, which is that the North America is now the center of gravity of the global system. It is not necessarily a nice place. It has all sorts of unpleasant things happening, but it is the only thoroughly secure region and controls the world's oceans. And that means that the fundamental American power is projected outward. During the Cold War, we projected power eastward, eastward to support NATO. And the war plans that were had then, called Reforger, essentially saw American forces surging across the Atlantic in the event of war. This might have actually worked, but we never tried it. At this point, we are engaged with China to some extent on their home territory. So we are right off their coast. We have the ability to define the battlefield, if there's going to be one, economic and political, by the fact that we can place our forces and even our economy where we want it. Others cannot come here without facing great risk. So this is a fundamental reality of the world. Now, at any given time, it looks like the United States is going to collapse. This is because the United States is built on creative destruction, as Schumpeter said. We destroy our institutions and build new ones. I've written a book arguing that this is the health of the United States. We will take the question of race and allow it to rip the country's soul apart. And very few other countries would allow that to happen. We will have discussions of economic power and how it's structured. And this can be confused by a country that's weak as an American weakness. Weak countries having this level of dispute collapse. You could not be a weak country with a weak government uh, and survive the kind of tension that goes with the United States. But you can in the United States, you do. So I lived through the Vietnam War where the anti-war movement was powerful, assassinations of Martin Luther King and others happened, where the president was found to be a criminal and told to leave the office. And so we've seen this before. So there is a disjuncture between power and the internal perception of operations. Geopolitics defines where you are. It defines what you can do but it leaves very open what kind of regime you'll have. There could be many regimes in the United States that could be because it's position powerful. We have one that is built on internal conflict. 
And one of the great mistakes that are made by Europeans is because they had such conflicts and it ripped them apart, they assumed that it will the United States. So it is important to understand the dynamic, the internal dynamic of each country, which is unique. And again, not subject to policy, okay? Because we don't want to have this, but we are going to have this. This is the issue that will haunt us and it simply will be there, but it's haunted us for over a century and we survive. So we live in a world in which there are, other than the United States, three powers that we have to consider. Let's consider first Russia. What does Russia want? It wants, it must have the return of strategic depth. It defeated the Swedes, it defeated the French, it twice sort of defeated the Germans. Each time, because the distance from the frontier to the capital was too great for them to go. With the collapse of the pro-Russian Ukrainian government, which the Russians blame on us, all right, uh, they suddenly saw the frontier of Western influence 500 miles from Moscow. They knew they could survive when the frontier was somewhere around Poland. They were not sure they could survive this way. So what we've seen from the Russians is an attempt at rectification of power. Now, Russia has difficulties doing this because it's a third world country. It survives primarily in the export of energy, a commodity which, whose price it does not control, which is the classic definition, and it has failed consistently to build a modern economy. So it has to always resort, instead of from economic power, as China does, to the use of either military force, the threat of military force, or what we'll call covert political force, which is for them soft power. We first saw them this year using soft power in Belarus. Belarus is a critical country. If it is in the hands of the West, Smolensk is now a border town, not the heartland of Russia. If Russia has Smolensk, then the Polish border is very difficult to defend. So Russia did something very intelligent. It created a situation based on internal politics in Belarus that allowed it to not appear to hold Belarus while holding Belarus, or at least for the time being. In other words, it did not risk threatening Poland, although the Poles will be threatened by anything. Uh, it did not risk threatening Poland, but it did put itself in a position where it bought strategic depth. To understand Russia's foreign policy, always think strategic depth. This is what they depend on. A very similar thing happened shortly thereafter in the South Caucasus. The Southern Caucasus are the path into Russia. It's the path that Turkey took. It's always the second danger point. If the first danger point is the Northern European plain, the second one is the Caucasus. So the Russians took a conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan over Nagorno-Karabakh and handled it in such a way that it managed to be allies with both not good allies, but allies with both, they had no choice, with Azerbaijan, and was able to place thousands of troops into Nagorno-Karabakh, which is the pivot of the South Caucasus. So where previously its line was the thin line of the North Caucasus, of Chechnya, Dagestan, Abkhazia, places like that, it returned to its pre-collapse position. What we are seeing from the Russians is the return to the old frontiers, not of the Soviet Union, 
but of the Soviet Empire before the Soviet Union. This is where they stood their line. And they had to return there by using what I'll call soft power. By soft power, not direct aggression to occupy, but using the internal forces in the region to create outcomes that are satisfactory. There is, of course, one great issue for Russia, Ukraine. Ukraine was the other transit from the Carpathian Mountains into Russia. It was the other line that the, so that the Germans took. It is what Germany took away from Russia in the brest Treaty, and they want it back. And they believe that the uprising in Kiev was engineered by the United States. It's like this much is true. The Russians use hacking to destabilize. We use NGOs. We don't mean to, uh, to destabilize. We're very nice people. They're there to help, always. But that's not how the Russians view it. The Russians view their attacks against our system as a response to Maidan, because it sees the rising as primarily engineered by the Americans. I always ask one question when I see an uprising, where are the bathrooms? Because if you're going to hit 100,000 people in a square, you've got to have to have bathrooms. And there were bathrooms. And where do they come from? So we have to understand that each nation, as a matter of policy, will plead innocence even when they're caught with their hand in the jar, as we say. But Russia is going to have to try to find a way. And the way they will try to find it in Ukraine is the soft politics they use elsewhere to create internal Ukrainian problems. And then without directly interfering, engage. Why? Because if they directly engage, the United States might respond. And when the Russians learned in the, Ukraine, in the Cold War is the Americans are disproportionate in their response the amount they will do. And because the United States has disproportionate strength. So how do you regain the Soviet empire, the Russian empire, in, in the face of overwhelming American power? The answer is you divert it. The Russians were the masters of diversion. We will now worry about our computer systems. That, that, that will be the battlefield. So then we turn to the Chinese. China is a very weak power. It is the third largest power, uh, second largest economy in the world. But per capita, per individual income, they're the 77th. They rank beyond behind Guyana, which means if you have a billion and a half people, an economy smaller than the United States, you're going to have a very weak per capita system, which means that somebody's going to be very poor. Now, since you've transferred income growth to the coastal region from international trade, it's the interior, the western part, that is living in, I estimate, at the level of equatorial Africa simply by looking at the numbers. The numbers don't always mean the same thing. They may live better, they may live worse. But what you see is in the areas where they're most likely to have unrest, Xinjiang, the Chinese are at least reacting, if not overreacting. In Hong Kong, they're overreacting. They're arresting rich people, which the Chinese don't like to arrest rich people. So if you look Objectively, the internal process, you see a government that is concerned about its stability. It has a second fear. It depends on international trade. It must have it. The United States wanted reciprocal international trade. The Chinese denied it. And it was the Obama administration that accused them of violating WTO standards and so on. So this is not Trump. 
The Chinese cannot give the United States what they want. Because if they give the Americans access to the interior of China, well, their ability to grow their economy shifts to the American ability to grow the economy. They will keep us out. But they have a huge problem. They must have trade with the rest of the world. And the US Navy is in a position to block all of their ports. The US Navy is deployed in the South China Sea and in other regions and has, and this is very important, an alliance more powerful than NATO was. Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Philippines, depending if Duarte hasn't drunk that day. Uh, Indonesia working with the United States uh, to a great extent. The Vietnamese are anti-Chinese and working with us in, in the sea. Singapore, where we have a base. Australia, of course. The total net GDP of that alliance is about $38 trillion to the Chinese 14. It is an alliance structure that usually isn't paid attention to because they want us to go to dinner at, in Brussels and talk to the Europeans. Well, that's not who we're talking to. The idea that the United States does no longer internationalist flies in the face that over the past 10 years, we've built an informal but very real alliance. And China is facing this. And China is facing how to break out of it. Now, China is talking about invading uh, Taiwan. It's possible. Usually you don't announce where you're invading. It's a bad idea. You go as a surprise. So my first reaction is they may invade somewhere, but it's not going to be you know, Taiwan. It's also very difficult to invade a country. It's very difficult to invade it because you have to supply the troops at land. And there's a long line of ships that are coming in, as there was in Normandy. And the Americans do have a few missiles that might work. We know the Chinese are much better than we are, but we may just be able to do something. And the one thing that China can't afford to do is lose. Because if it loses, it's internal and external credibility. So what will the Chinese do? They will talk a lot about war. And they will leak to the New York Times their amazing new missile that not only can destroy New York, but will clean your house at the same time. It's, of course, this is what we did. Now, the United States has a habit of vastly overestimating its enemy. We saw the Soviet Union as our equal. We had this, they must have that. We had this. We didn't realize that half the troops are drunk, which actually affects the, the balance of power. I mean, we understood the Russians without understanding their weaknesses. And it is a very good American habit to overestimate your enemy. But sometimes it goes too far. The Chinese have never fought a naval battle. The only one they fought was in 1895 and they lost to the Japanese. There's such a thing as institutional memory. That means within the Japanese Navy, when they attacked Pearl Harbor, they drew on what they learned at the Battle of Tsushima Straits. They remembered it institutionally. When we carry out a naval exercise, we remember the lessons we've learned from Korea to Vietnam, the bad lessons too, and so The Chinese have never fought a naval engagement. An amphibious assault is considered in the mind of military people the single most difficult exercise. You've landed troops, you must supply troops, you must maintain air superiority, you must control, coordinate everything. Now the Americans are experienced in war and most of our wars turn out to be chaotic because it is in the nature of war to be chaotic. Could the Chinese win a war? Possibly. But if there's a war, it is on their doorstep, not on ours. And this is the important 
thing to remember when we talk about the strength of the Navy. We are fighting, we're not going to fight, but we would be fighting on their doorstep. They're not off of Los Angeles. We are off of Shanghai. And a war, even if it's won, gives the United States strategic room to regroup, rearm, and re-engage. So if you are China and you are in this situation that you have internal problems, you have the world's major power making hostile moves along your shore, what do you do? Well, the Russians have a word, maskerovka. You invent, I don't know the Chinese word for this, you create this vision of China being the great economic power of the world. How do you do this? You give some money to this country, you give something to that country, you don't actually deliver it, you announce it. You do all these things. You do everything you can to appear to be stronger possible, rational and necessary given their circumstance. But geopolitics requires you to sit there and count the ships, to sit there and understand that they have only six amphibious assault ships. And with six amphibious assault ships, you cannot wage a war if the United States intervenes. It requires you not to be talking in generalities, but in very specific things. Geopolitics constantly forces you to the specific. And I will close with Europe. And I'm closed. But what, what is there to say about Europe? Europe began with this notion of a European identity. There is no European identity. A Pole does not resemble a Dutchman. This, this is very true. I've seen both. These are fundamentally different countries. What you had before was a free trade zone, which was an excellent idea. But here you have a central bureaucracy that is constantly failing in crisis. It failed to really handle 2008, the central bank. Didn't. It failed in the immigration crisis, managed, right? And now the vaccines. Now, distributing vaccines is difficult, but the Europeans like to show the Americans how much better they do than we do. And nothing bothers them more than we did better than they did, and that Trump was the one responsible for making it happen. This disturbs their entire... The, Russia, the European Union is not a nation state, as they've pointed out. It has no military power, that rests within NATO, and that depends on the Americans. So what we have here is after 1991, Russia desperately trying to regain the depth it had before the fall of the Soviet Union. The Chinese urgently trying to maintain its internal markets. I mean, the United States is the largest importer in the world. China is the largest exporter. I've been in business a little. You don't piss off your largest customer. But the Chinese had to. And you have to understand why they had to, to make sense of what's going on. And why they substituted other means to try to deal with the United States. And you have the United States with huge amount of freedom of maneuver. Because it has the two oceans. And a very serious discussion in the United States, why are we interested in Europe? It's hard to explain, you know, it's a, it's a tough one. Europe can't be responsible for itself. So Europe attempted to overcome geopolitics by mashing everybody together into one entity and putting bureaucrats, technocrats as they called them, in, in charge. It's not awful, it's not good. Um, in a, they're fighting within themselves and the second largest economy in Europe, Britain left and the Europeans laughed at, ha, now they're going to get it. <laughs> uh, so you have China trying desperately to modernize and needing to keep the United States out of their economy 
now facing the United States with a war that's not going to happen between the United States and China. You have the Russians pressing westward on the Europeans, who are again trying to decide maybe we should be friends with the Russians because this time will be different. And the Americans profoundly indifferent to foreign policy. It's far away, it really doesn't matter, and we are not going to get into it. But all lot of this has to do with policy papers that were driven, written even by the Rand Corporation. These have to do with the underlying realities that compel us to be what we are at this point. And I will stop and allow people to throw things at me. Thank you so much. It is a fascinating picture of the world and it reveals so many um, uh, dynamics and so many, so such a strong rationale behind moves that uh, are often shown in uh, international media as uh, irrational or aggressive moves. And I think it is a very important moment for us to understand, you know, on the basis of this, I would be very curious to see, uh, it makes, uh, it is, you made a very strong case why the United States uh, uh, should not be active and more sort of present inside Europe um, as a traditional ally, as a, a former uh, center of gravity, as a pre previous sort of reminiscence of a previous uh, uh, geostrategic reality. Um, do you have um, absolutely no uh, arguments in favor of a US uh, Europe? discussion. And with this, I would like to uh, open up also for the uh, <clears throat> participants in our discussion who are following um, uh, our event. Uh, please send your uh, questions on the question and answer platform and um, I will be reading them uh, and we will be, we'll try to make sure that uh, all your questions will be answered. So please uh, send your questions in, and comments in writing. So, um, do you see absolutely no rationale for the U.S. to be interested in Europe at all? I'm definitely interested in Europe. I'd like going to Budapest a lot. <laughs> but we were in the Cold War facing powerful, what we saw as a powerful Soviet Union. And we could not accept the Soviet Union on the Atlantic. Stopping the Soviet Union was a overwhelming point. At this point, the Soviets will not try to invade Western Europe. They want to trade with Western Europe. They want economic relations. Destroying Western Europe undermines them. In other words, the thing that we were there for was not liberal democracy. What we were there for is to prevent the geopolitical catastrophe where they would challenge the Atlantic. There is no such challenge, nor is there an alliance. Uh, the Europeans have basically abandoned NATO. They go to the meetings, they have very nice lunches, it's, it's, it's very good. But you cannot have a military alliance without a military. Since the United States has the only military, and Germany is the fourth largest economy in the world, finding ourselves defending Germany, while Germany doesn't have a military, would be irrational. Therefore, there's not an imperative forcing us into this, nor is there a European dynamic that would welcome us. So it's not a question of would I like it or not. The reality at this point is that the global dynamic is in the Pacific, not in the Atlantic. And for the time being, at least, uh, Europe is perfectly capable economically to defend itself. If it chooses not to, well, we may have to anyway, but not now. Okay. We have a couple of questions that are <clears throat> fascinating. Let me start with a more theoretical one uh, uh, from our friend H.W. Uh, Hanke, um, who says, greatly appreciate Dr. Friedman's very erudite, er erudite analysis of global geopolitics and really geostrategic balance and dynamics. At the same time, I'm curious to what extent geopolitics as a heuristic tool serves us well to understand the conflicts of the future. I think it's extremely powerful, precisely because it brushes aside all the personalities. Um, we understand Russia and what it must have, strategic depth. We understand China, what it must have, 
an insulated market so it can develop and can't afford a war. We understand what the United States needs from the world, which is very little. So the situation that we have when you look at this is when you eliminate all the wish lists of all the leaders, when you forget that Erdogan is the Erdogan and begin to look at Turkey as Turkey, you get a longer sense of what is necessary. And what you must have, what is a heuristic element is, what must you have? What can't you accept? And within these polls, history takes place. Thank you so much. There are many questions, so I try to uh, make sure that we can get to all of them. Uh, there is another one which is also uh, along the lines that we have talked about, and then there will be others in uh, more about U.S. Uh, in general domestic issues. Let me uh, try to sh um, focus on the various areas. So, Andre Larocque, the world's great powers have not been directly at war with each other since World War II or Korea, before the significant development of nuclear arsenals. You're talking in terms of the serious possibility of conventional wars between such powers. Shouldn't we assume? that those would escalate into a nuclear conflict and we're back to factoring in um, MED as an important deterrent. Well, put it this way, between the Napoleonic Wars and World War I, a century passed, there was no war in Europe. There were those who argued that war has been abolished in Europe. As Trotsky said, you may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. The there are frequently gaps in war. And by the way, I'm not predicting war. I do not believe the US and China will go to war. I don't believe that it's going to be a war in Europe over the Russians. I think we're in a period of extended peace. But one of the things that nuclear weapons have done is limited war, oddly enough, which is every nation understands that a nuclear power will go so far before they have to do something radical. So it was understood by the Arabs in the 73 war that you could push the Israelis only so far before they went nuclear. And they were very careful not to push the Israelis that far. So the Americans are clearly aware that the Chinese are nuclear power. China is aware that we are. And I think one of the things this interestingly does is rather than making wars more likely, it makes it less likely, and the other thing that it does is it imposes prudence on political leaders. China could be much more aggressive at this point, or try to be. The Americans could be. But we both understand that in the end of the day, we all want to go home and sleep in our beds. And as they used to say, and I think that the oddity of nuclear weapons is in containing war. Now, it takes one lunatic to make me wrong, but still I see that. Thank you so much. Uh, another uh, question along a similar, um, uh, along a more the Fulbright um, mission itself. Uh, let me take that to the front uh, for a second. Celia Evans, uh, I'd like to know what Dr. Frieden thinks of the role of the sort of work that Fulbright does and our own work of bringing students and people to meet with people in these countries. I think this is valuable. I mean, there are th three dimensions of geopolitics. One is war, perhaps the least important. The other is economics, and the other is politics, the day-to-day -day processing. The more that we understand the day-to-day -day political processes, and the more we open markets to each other and so on, th the better it will be. So I'm not arguing that we're automatons trapped in a world. I'm saying that the broad picture is fixed, but that within that broad picture, there are very important things to be done. So we haven't had World War II in a while. And in the meantime, all sorts of subcritical things have been happening. And I see the Fulbright people as weaving relationships that may not change the ultimate course of history, but will make the immediate period extremely much better than it was. Fascinating. And who knows?
hopefully yeah, uh, also having a strategic uh, depth to the uh, to the relations as well. Uh, well, but what they can do is understand what's impossible. One of my problems with foreign policy people is that they do not understand what the other country cannot give them. And they, they just can't grasp that this is never going to happen. And then they fight domestically. So going away with an understanding of what's impossible is incredibly valuable, especially when you tell the other guys. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> Maybe along the uh, in what's possible and what's not possible, a question without a name. Uh, how does the United States foreign policy towards the Middle East, such as favoritism towards Israel and military action in Afghanistan and elsewhere, affect the geopolitical world? Well, Israel, Israel, the United States doesn't have to be favorable to Israel. Israel is now a regional superpower that can take care of itself. And half the time we're worried what they're going to do. Okay, in Iran, for example, the question is not aligned on this. Uh, the Middle East is the southwest corner of Eurasia. It is historically that in Asia Minor, the area where Europe and Asia meet. And it's always chaotic. So after World War I, the British came in and took it over for the oil. But this is a region that is very difficult to settle down. That every time you think it's settled, internal things come up. Unpredictable internal things such as happened in Jordan recently. But the American strategy in the region is the one that Obama came up with. Get out. Or definitely go there and make speeches, have dinners, then go home. We failed in the Middle East. We failed to create what we wanted to create. This is Obama's position. This is Trump's position. I don't know what Biden's going to say about this, but it's going to be his position. So under these circumstances, we have to understand the limits of American power. And this is what, in the, in the world, it's frequently the question, what will the Americans do? Well, it's nothing because they can't do anything. And nothing because they don't want to do anything. We have been fighting in 18 years in the Middle East. My daughter fought two tours of duty in Iraq. I don't want my grandchildren fighting in the Middle East. As for Israel, I mean, 20 years ago, you could say that the United States supports Israel. Israel has evolved into a country that is leading an Arab alliance, you know, the Abraham Treaty. So history has moved on. We have to move on with rhetoric. But it is an interesting thing to understand, which I don't fully understand, why Israel has emerged. And so as to listening to the United States, <laughs> I wish they would. <laughs> Thank you. Um, which will bring us to another part of the world. Another very interesting question from Rizana Mahrouf. Very interesting talk. Thank you, Dr. Friedman. With the rising military power, and growing economy, where do you see India in this very interesting spectrum of geopolitical fabric? Well, this is a very important question because as the United States economically is shut out of China and shuts China out of the United States to some extent, it's gonna be very important to watch India. India has an internal problem. It's not a country. It's a bunch of different countries bound together by the British they don't like each other. So here you have a geopolitical problem. You have a state, which is not necessarily a nation. How India binds together, this is not an impossible task, but how India binds together over the next decade or so, this determines the future of American companies love Bangalore. They won't go to Kerala. So, um, to create an India which is welcoming, you have to have an India which is welcoming. <laughs> so this is really the test. But with the tension with China, India is the alternative in relationships, has now joined the Quad, fa fairly informally joined the Quad, the four powers, Japan, United States, and Australia patrolling the Pacific is now there with us. So. Everything is open for them right now. They have to 
create a platform that's stable enough to enter. Wow. Uh, in still <laughs> remaining in the uh, region, uh, another question from Jay Nathan. How important is Mongolia to US global policy? Thank you, Jay, for the question. I would have to say not much. <laughs> I mean, look, it'd be nice to, if, if it wasn't Latin but with the Russians on one side and the Chinese on the other side, I mean, this is a wonderful place to go and you know, be a spy and spy on everybody, but it, it's simply ge geographically not possible for us to have an extended presence there. Certainly not with our relationship with China and Russia there. Thank you. Quickly, uh, and another very interesting one, Robert Gervasi, you've said that, the, that war is less important than economics in geopolitics. Therefore, should the US spend less on the military and more on international trade initiatives? I said at this moment, war is less important. During World War II, it was very important, uh, but they're really linked. You have no military force if you have no economy. You can wind up having no economy if you don't have a military force, look what happened to Germans. When we talk about these different things, we really have to understand that they're deeply linked. So the three pillars of geopolitics, one is politics, and by that I don't mean who becomes Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, I mean the real politics that takes place in the countryside, where we are for, where, where Texas confirms who it is. This, coupled with economics, coupled with war, at various times they change in importance. At this moment in history, I don't see war as a major dimension of what is tearing the world. It is economics. It is also politics in, in, in the each of different states. So it depends what year you live in. I mean, you are living in 70 years after World War II. The chances are in your lives, you will see another major war, it's just statistically, but I don't see where it comes from. China is not going to war with the United States. The United States is certainly not invading China. Russia is tiptoeing through the bushes, hope, hoping nobody notices it. This is a time of relative peace. This is a time when nations can build their economies and stabilize their social structures. Okay, there are many questions and I really appreciate, but we shouldn't take it too much longer. Maybe one last one on a topic that is uh, uh, very, in the forefront, climate. Um, what geopolitical implications do you see by establishing a climate clubs? Who needs to be in those um, to actually achieve enough pressure? So um, there's a reason that people don't respond to this. First, they'll be dead by the time this will happen. But second, the modeling of the climate is very poor. In other words, I do military modeling, so I know a little enough about modeling to get it completely wrong. But the variables that are being fed into the system tend to come out with the answers that the people want. There are any number of models that are very confused. So everybody speaks about global warming as if it's self-evidently true. It may be. I don't know. I'm not an expert on that. But I do know that the modeling process is not using enough data, that we don't know what data is really relevant. We observe that there is a rise in, you know, in, in temperature. We in Texas really enjoyed the rise in tex temperature last month. <laughs> and I was burned I took our house down. Uh, yeah. But no, I'm, I'm very serious. This is a serious question. And when I look at the question you know, I, I would look at statistics higher than 50, for 50 years, this didn't happen. That means 50 years ago, it happened. That means there's no big thing. So what I'm saying is that the really serious models that are out there that are very complex have ambiguous findings. Now, politically, everybody knows the world is, and I'm perfectly happy to do it. Politically, nothing is gonna change because those of us who are alive now are not going to sacrifice. We're a very selfish race, aren't going to sacrifice, which is why in the Club of Paris, which we urgently had to join, nobody's, you know, some people are, but most people aren't bothering to do anything. 
because politically absorbing the cost of something that they won't be around or may never happen. So one of the things is that the, in my view, the people who believe in climate change believe in fact climate change and believing in something is not persuasive. The explanation, the clarity and explanation of how this is happening, why this is happening now, and most important, has this happened before? And that's hard to do because we don't keep records. This isn't addressed. And this is why the climate people are so frustrated. They want to see people accept this principle. And people are, but not enough to change how we behave. Oh, <clears throat> yes, very sobering and very insightful. Maybe I, one. I, and I never go to Washington and say this. It's terrible to do this. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> yes. Maybe if I can have one more minute for a, a question that is coming from also another member of the board, and I would like to just sure. take that as a last one. And thank you so much for for your your time, Allison. Uh, uh, Grady, do you think that foreign policy as a field tends to appreciate how different countries look as they stretch from their capital cities to and major cities towards their outer borders and how these lawless uh, and how she says how lawless much of each country can be in its hinterlands? I don't think at all. I think they spend too much time meeting with their counterparts. Professors meet with professors. Uh, ambassadors meet with ambassadors, and this is a natural thing. But in several countries where I've gone, I've gone off to, to the hinterland. What's interesting to me is that these are the people who, if they rise up, will create an earthquake. And it's good to, to meet with them, but it's also uncomfortable because they tend, tend to be poor. They tend not to have nice five-star hotels. And what I've observed about my colleagues, you know, they tend to be comfortable with the people they know. They also don't have language skills, which is a serious problem. So I think it is absolutely essential to go you know, to the people. So I say always, and Rika knows this, you've been to Washington, why not come to America next? <laughs> In other words, Washington is such a strange place and is so unlike America that you can get a completely different view of it. So everybody come to Texas. We'll drink five star. We'll go out dancing on a Saturday night and you'll have a fist fight. You'll meet America. <laughs> Wonderful. On this cheerful note, <laughs> I would like to thank you That's so very much. For... That's very cheerful. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and very encouraging to discover America. <laughs> very important. And the hinterlands of our of other countries where we operate. And I very uh, by much... the way, in Texas, we do not regard ourselves as a hinterland. New York yeah. is a hinterland. We're America. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time and the insights. It has been a fascinating discussion and as always giving so much perspective and so much food for thought that it's incredibly invaluable and very inspiring. So thank, thank you, you so much for accepting the invitation and very much hope to keep in touch with the Fulbright Association as well. I really, uh, I, I regard Fulbright as important. I would like it to be less policy oriented and more nationally oriented, go into the countryside. And then you get a different sense of what's going to happen. That plus study geopolitics. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try to make uh, our best in both directions. <laughs> George, thank you so much for this wonderful discussion. It's been wonderful to have you. And thank you all for having joined us for the wonderful questions. And um, sorry if we left out on one or two, but I hope we've managed to go through almost all of them. Uh, look forward to continuing the discussion and thanks very much again to our dear speaker, Dr. George Friedman. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much again, Ambassador Rekha and Dr. George Friedman for um, this amazing presentation. Uh, thank you to our members and donors who make all this possible. And here are some of the upcoming Fulbright forums in the coming weeks.
Um, on April 22nd, we have a global sea level rise and a changing coastal future. And then on May 11th, we have fighting human trafficking. Thanks so much and have a great day. We're off. Um.